happy Sabbath, <clears throat> everyone out there and uh, everyone out there on the webcast. And uh, welcome back to the biography channel. Let's just see if it's back up there. Are we good here? Now there was a handout that was uh, handed out before the service began. Um, if you didn't get one, um, there we will be posting that up on the fellowship site after church. Uh, just to let you know, uh, straight after church, we usually post the audio files of both the sermon and the sermon up to the fellowship site. And if we have a PowerPoint message like I'm doing today, um, I usually put up the video about two or three days after the, uh, the service. Okay. Now, if we read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, one thing that we'll see is that God has always been primarily interested in what's going on inside our hearts. And the Bible identifies one man as personifying what it means to have a good heart. Now we know him as King David, who is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Now the Bible makes no effort to hide David's many failures, yet he is still remembered for having a heart like God's. Now let's look at the context of this famous description of David. Now after the first of Saul's two major sins, that led to his rejection as a king, Samuel said to Saul in 1 Samuel 13 verse 14 that God has sought a man after his own heart. Now this expression was said when David was still a teenage boy tending his father's sheep. Now God made this famous pronouncement about David at the beginning of his rise to fame before some of his great mistakes that he made later in his life. Now this pronouncement about David is repeated long after his death over in Acts 13 verse 22 where Paul in a synagogue during his first missionary journey gives a quote from God that is a paraphrase rather than a direct Old Testament quote and he says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who shall fulfill all my will. Now, for a long time, Bible critics claimed that there was no record of David's existence outside of the Bible and dismissed David as a real historical king. Now, the critics were silenced when part of a victory stellar of an Aramean king was found by Abraham Biran at Tel Dan. Now, on the victory stellar, the Aramean king, believed to be Hazael, announces that he has subdued the king of Israel and another king from the house of David. Now the kings he subdued are believed to be Ahab's son Jehoshaphat, oh, sorry, Jehoram, and Jehoshaphat's grandson Ahaziah. Now the story of King David is covered in three books of the Bible. Now his story, up until Saul's death, is covered in the second half of 1 Samuel. His years as king are covered throughout the whole of the book of 2 Samuel. Now originally 1 and 2 Samuel was one book of which Samuel wrote the first half of. And a parallel account of David's years as king, minus the story of uh, Bathsheba and Uriah, is given in 1 Chronicles from chapter 11 to the end of the book. Now today I'm going to break up the story of David's life into five major parts. Firstly, we have David's early years including his selection as king and his slaying of Goliath, two, his wilderness years being pursued by Saul, three, his early years as king over Judah and then over all of Israel, four, David's adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah, as told to us in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, and the last section would be David's latter years as king. Now David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for, for 40 years from around 1009 to 969 BC. Now David came from the town of Bethlehem, a town about 10 kilometres south of Jerusalem. That means the house of bread. Now the true bread of heaven, Jesus Christ, a descendant of David would later be born there as well. Now David's famous great-grandparents were Ruth and Boaz, who also came from Bethlehem. 
And the Bible tells us that David was the youngest of seven sons, and he also had two sisters. Now we first meet David when Samuel is told by God to go to Bethlehem to anoint one of Jesse's sons as Saul's successor as king. Now when Samuel thinks one of David's brothers is surely the right one to be anointed king, the Lord says to him, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now all of David's older brothers pass by Samuel, and God says that none of them are the one that he wants as king. Now Samuel asks Jesse if he has any other sons, and then Jesse says, well, there remains the youngest, but behold, he's out there keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and he had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now David here is referred to as being handsome with beautiful eyes, and he was ruddy. Now the Hebrew word uh, ruddy means reddish. So it appears that David was a redhead or a ringer, as some people refer to him as. Now, I reckon that David may have looked a little bit like this. <laughs> One of his uh, famous red-headed descendants, Prince Harry. Now, after Samuel anoints him as king, God's spirit comes upon him. Now, we're not told whether or not Samuel told David that he'd already that God had already rejected Saul as king. Now David may have thought Saul was still God's choice to remain as king up until his eventual death. Now David has no thoughts of immediately taking over as king. I mean, why would he? He's still just a young boy. Now David is known for his skill, skillful harp playing, and as a result of this, he's actually brought from time to time to play for Saul to help soothe his terrible moods. Now around this time, the Philistines come to fight Israel in the Valley of Elah. Now amongst them is a giant named Goliath, who is over nine feet tall, who day after day challenges Israel for a single man-on-man -man combat battle. Now, all the Israelites are too afraid to challenge him. And this includes King Saul, who had told his head and shoulders above all of uh, the Israelite men. And he's probably, who's probably about six foot six himself. Now, David comes down with provisions for his brothers and inquires about what's happening and then courageously volunteers to fight Goliath. Now, when he talks to Saul and offers to fight Goliath, he tells Saul that he trusts God to give him the deliverance, just as God backed him up and gave him deliverance against both a lion and a bear when protecting the sheep. Now, when people think about David killing the lion and the bear when protecting the sheep, often people think that David used a slingshot to kill the lion, like he did with Goliath. But the account says that he struck the lion now, shepherds, as per what's stated in Psalm 23, had both a rod and a staff. Now, the staff with a hook at the end was used to guide and direct the sheep. The rod was a stick with a thick knob at the end, and it was used to part and inspect the wool, but also to protect the sheep from predators. It would have been one of these shepherd's rods that David used to strike and kill the lion that stole a sheep. Now David was full of confidence, not in his own ability, but in God's power to back up his actions when he went up against Goliath. To Goliath he said over in 1 Samuel 17, 
You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The Lord will deliver you into my hand today, and all this multitude shall know that the Lord does not save a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Now it's hard not to love his courage and complete confidence in God to back him up here. He's only concerned with God's will and honour and has complete trust that God will back up his efforts as God did with the lion and the, bre- the, sorry, the bear previously. Now when you are passionate about God's will and caring for others, it can give you great courage to push through and do the right thing even when you are afraid. Now Goliath did actually have a defensive weapon to protect himself, but he was either too complacent in his defence or his armour bearer just didn't hold up the shield high enough. And God ensured that the stone hit him right between the eyes and killed him. It turned out to be more lethal than a bouncer from Jeff Thompson. Now, this brings us to our first lesson that we can learn from King David. Courageously and completely trust God as David did in his young years. Now, there's something odd in 2 Samuel 21 verse 19, where it seems to say that someone else by the name of Elhanan killed Goliath. However, if we compare that verse With the parallel verse in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5, it says that this person killed Goliath's brother, not Goliath. So there appears to have been a scribal error in 2 Samuel where the words about the brother were accidentally dropped. Now in 1 Samuel 18, we read how Saul became very jealous of David when women sang, Saul has killed a thousand enemies. David has killed 10,000 enemies. And he then tries to kill David twice with a javelin before David escapes. He then tries to have Jonathan and his men go after David and kill him. Now by this time, Jonathan has struck up a really deep, loving friendship with David. And so he intercedes on David's behalf. And he manages to persuade Saul to not kill him. And so David comes back to court for a time. And then the evil spirit comes on Saul again. And again he tries to spear him with a javelin. And this time, both Jonathan and his wife, Michal, who is the daughter of Saul, then assist David in escaping from the hand of Saul. Now the noble character of Jonathan is quite astonishing in his dealings with David and King Saul. Jonathan would have made a very fine king had Saul been more obedient towards God. Now Saul was somewhere between 30 and 40 years older than David. So Jonathan, being his firstborn son, would have probably been about 10 to 20 years older than David. Now despite being much older, David, sorry, Jonathan has this wonderful humility to happily play second fiddle alongside of David. Now, had Jonathan been there for David during his years as king, he may have even helped David to avoid some of the costly mistakes that he made during his time as king. Now, David's wife, Michal, cares for David and also helped assist him to escape by placing an image in their bed with a wig of goat's hair to give the impression that David is under the blankets. Now, the word for image here is teraphim, which means an idol. It makes you wonder why David's wife, Michal, has an idol nearby to give the impression that David is under the blankets. Was idolatry on her part perhaps the snare to David that Saul thought she might be to him? Now, David then flees to where Samuel the prophet is up at Ramah. And then Saul's men on three occasions, and then Saul himself, try to go there and kill David. But God's spirit temporarily moves them to prophesy with the other prophets. 
I mean, on each occasion, these men were far from thinking God's thoughts, yet God moved them to not only stop pursuing David, but then to come back prophesying for God. Very unusual situation. Now, God can control us against our natural will if he wants to, but he doesn't do that as that would remove our free moral agency. Now, this occasion here, though, is one of those rare exceptions. Now, King, now David, over approximately the next five years, we read that uh, the Bible records the, the cat and mouse story between where David is trying to avoid being killed by Saul and his men. So from Ramah, at the top of the map here, David then goes to a priestly sanctuary at Nob, which is just north of the Mount of Olives, to get provisions. He then tries to get into the Philistine city of Gath um, to get beyond Saul's reach. On this occasion, he fails to get in. And then he goes to Adullam, where 400 others in distress come and join him. Now, after taking his parents to be protected uh, by the king of Moab, he returns to the forest of Harath. And from there, David and his men save the town of Keilah from the Philistines. David then flees to Ziph, then to Moan, where Saul almost captures him, and then he goes to En Gedi. Now Saul then pursues him down to the En Gedi oasis with its lush vegetation and living flowing water, which is a great contrast to the nearby Dead Sea. Now Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, but he doesn't realise that David is in. Now David's men see this as God's way of delivering Saul into David's hand. Now David rejects this viewpoint and chooses not to kill him, and instead cuts the corner of the court of his robe to prove to Saul that he doesn't wish to harm him. Now notice here the humility of David in how he addresses Saul here at En Gedi. Now he was willing to lower himself, saying that he was of no great importance, even calling himself a dead dog and a flea, because being reconciled to Saul meant so much more to him than his pride and avenging himself. Now just as pride comes before a fall, so too does humility come before a restoration of any friendship, as Derek was talking about earlier. Now David here uses the power of humility and kindness to win back Saul's favour, and Saul temporarily repents of trying to kill him. Now, sadly, it was only temporary, and ultimately, Saul's insecurity got the better of him. So this brings us to the second lesson that we can learn from King David. Use humility and kindness and not retaliation as a way to restore broken friendships. Now, David and his men are next noted as being up in the region of Carmel, where the story of his dealings with Nabal and his wife Abigail takes place. Now, Abigail intercedes on behalf of her foolish husband, and following Nabal's death by a heart attack, she agrees to be David's wife. Now, David's first wife, Michal, was taken off him and given to another man by Saul. Now, David asked for and received her back from Saul's son Ishbosheth after he later became king. Now, Abigail is noted here as being both wise and good-looking. Now, despite that, we read that around the same time, David also takes Ahinoam as a wife who bears him his firstborn son, Amnon, who later raped his half-sister Tamar. Now, David here has begun his slide into polygamy, which was forbidden in the law to the kings of Israel. Now, while forbidden to Israel's kings... The reason it was often practiced is that it gave women a certain degree of physical and financial security in a world where there were lots of widows due to often constant warfare. It was often viewed as the lesser of two evils by women in the ancient world. Now David spares Saul's life again in the wilderness of Ziph 
where he sneaks into the camp while he's asleep and takes his spear and water jar to prove again that he means Saul no harm. And Saul again repents of trying to kill him. Now this time, Saul, oh sorry, David just snaps after the second apparent reconciliation with Saul. David loses all faith in Saul not going after him again and flees to the Philistine city of Gath to get beyond his reach. Now, what is David thinking here? And of all places, he goes to Gath, the town, hometown of Goliath. What, what, he is, what he is thinking here is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now somehow, he manages to persuade the king of Gath that he's not his enemy, and the king gives him and his men the town of Ziklag. Now while returning to Ziklag after being rejected by the Philistine princes, the Amalekites, in retaliation of David's raids, burn Ziklag and kidnap the women and the children. And then David and his men pursue and recover all of them. Now after the priests at Nob were killed by Saul, the son of the priest Ahimelech brought with him to David the ephod or the breastplate that contained the Urim and the Thummim by which they could inquire matters directly from God. Now for some reason I always think of the actress Uma Thurman whenever I think of read of the Urim and Thummim for some reason. Now the words Urim and Thummim mean lights and perfections or light and darkness depending on your source. Now nothing is known for sure exactly how they worked. Now one school of thought is that they were two gemstones that lit up in response to yes or no questions to God. Uh, perhaps one was a green emerald and the other was a red ruby. Now the other school of thought is that they were flat with two sides like heads and tails and they were flipped to answer yes or no questions, a little bit like the game of two-up. It is thought that this is how they would cast lots. Now just imagine how cool it would be to be able to ask God yes or no questions any time you wanted to by the means of the Urim and the Thummim. Now it is recorded on five occasions that, God, that David consulted God this way. Now the two times before he came king were when he asked whether they should save Keilah from the Philistines and whether to pursue the Amalekites after they kidnapped the women and the children. Now, nothing is recorded of David inquiring of God this way when he decided to go live with Israel's enemy, the Philistines. Now, while a very questionable decision, it did, however, give him the opportunity to deal with many of the remaining Amalekites on his rather clandestine raids. That said, there is a rather obvious question that De David never asked God about, even though he had access to the Urim and the Thummim. David never asked God about whether he was to be God's instrument in removing Saul from being king. Now, there is nothing in God's rejection of Saul in 1 Samuel 15 that implies he was to be king for the rest of his life. Now, Saul had already shed innocent blood when he had the priest killed at Nob before David has even first spared his life at En Gedi. Now that alone would have earned Saul the death penalty. Now David, despite not trusting Saul, still very deeply cared for his father-in-law. And it appears that the idea of killing was absolutely repugnant to him. He could have at any time consulted God by the Urim and the Thummim to clarify God's means of removing Saul as a king, but he didn't. Now it may be that God was behind this oversight in order to test David's character. And David is then crowned king over the tribe of Judah following the deaths of Saul and Jonathan, who he both deeply grieves for. Now, following the lead of Saul's commander Abner, the other tribes of Israel decide not to follow David and choose to follow Saul's youngest son, Ishabeth, who was crowned king over the northern tribes of Israel. Now, as they followed the existing dynasty, the northern tribes were able to retain the name Israel for the northern kingdom. And then we see civil war that goes on for about seven years between the two kingdoms. Now, David's first capital, Hebron, is a very important city to the Jews, as this is where Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and 
Leah were all buried in the cave of the patriarchs. King Herod, an Edomite, who was raised in the Jewish religion, built this structure above the cave. Now, its stones are very similar to the stones of the temple in Jerusalem, yet it has survived intact to this day. Now, following the murder of Ithbosheth, the elders of the other tribes decided to follow David, and they pledged their allegiance to David, and he is anointed king over Israel. Now, does this mean that the two nations became one nation again, like it was under King Saul? Most people assume that there was just one nation under David and Solomon, and that Israel only broke up into two nations following the death of Solomon. But is that what happened? Now, upon closer examination of the biblical record, we'll see that that wasn't quite the case. Now, notice here in 2 Samuel 5 and verse 5, it states that David reigned 33 years as king over Israel and Judah. We see further evidence of two separate kingdoms under one crowned ruler in the story of David numbering Israel. Now, David tells Joab to number Israel and Judah, and when Joab gives the numbers, he gives separate figures for the two kingdoms. Now, this dynastic union over two separate kingdoms is similar to what happened after the death of Queen Elizabeth I in England. Now, the next in line for the throne of England was James the sixth King of Scotland, and he became King James I of England and ruled both England and Scotland, which continued as separate nations with separate parliaments before their union a century later in 1707, which saw the birth of the United Kingdom. Now, ironically, the name United Kingdom is a name used by historians for the nation of Israel from King Saul to King Solomon. Now, there was tension between the two kings at times during the reign of David. Now, Sheba led the northern tribes to rebel and briefly break away after Absalom's death, but Joab was able to put down the rebellion. Now, this dynastic union over the two separate kingdoms continued into the reign of King Solomon, as seen in a couple of passages here. Now, David told Zadok and Nathan to anoint Solomon as king over Israel and Judah. And in two places in 1 Kings 4, it speaks of the prosperity of Judah and Israel throughout the reign of King Solomon. Now the tension between the two kingdoms spilled over after Solomon's death, leading to a permanent separation of the two kingdoms with separate rulers following the foolish choice of Rehoboam when Israel cried out for tax relief. Now in his first seven years before David has moved to Jerusalem, it says that he takes more wives in 2 Samuel chapter 3. And that David has six sons now from six different wives. At this point, he has at least seven wives when you include Michal, who bore David no children. Now, one of David's early acts as the king of all Israel is the capture of the town of Jebus from the Jebusites. Now, originally known as Salem, when Abraham met Melchizedek, Jebus would become the city of Jerusalem or the city of David after it was taken by the Jebusites. Now, the walls of Jerusalem's old city that we see today were built in the 1500s by the Ottoman Turks. The original city of David is outside of the walls of Jerusalem's old city. And it was on a ridge to the south of the old city's southeast corner. Now, with permission, I'd like to now, if all goes well, play for you a sh fantastic short animated video that shows how Jerusalem was captured by, from the Jebusites. He promises the esteemed position of head of the army to the soldier who dares to volunteer for this dangerous mission and succeeds. One man rises to the challenge, Joab ben Zeruya, a tough and daring soldier. But what is the mission? In his challenge, David uses two mysterious words, Veiga Batsinor. What is this Tsinor that David is referring to? 
Thousands of years later, a fascinating discovery was made, shedding light on the mysterious Tsinor. In 1867, the archaeologist Captain Charles Warren crawled through a tunnel near the Gihon Spring. About 20 meters from the spring, Warren discovered a vertical shaft that rose to a height of 13 meters above his head. With great effort, Warren climbed to the top of the shaft where, to his amazement, he discovered that the tunnel continued to rise steeply until it reached the city above. Warren Evin Miyad, she left an av, mifal main sodi, she divna, lifne alfei shanim. Atichnuna ebe tuchkam beyoter. Aknalim yadu, she nekudat a tova shel irami, a maayan, she mitzam lechutz lechomot ayir. They built a great citadel around the spring and dug a tunnel down from the city above to the citadel surrounding the spring. David Megale, at the Fala Maima Kadun. That's enough. He sends Joa ben Surya through this tunnel to infiltrate the city. After Job exits the tunnel, he runs down to the city gates. The Jewicide soldiers fail to notice him. Job reaches the city gates and opens them with great force. Before the Jubicides can grasp what has happened, David's soldiers burst through the gates and take the city by surprise. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. Now that's a that's quite a great little video that one. Um, one thing that uh, isn't explained in the Bible's account is um, with the capture of Jebus uh, is that it doesn't explain how Jake, Joab was able to even get to the spring to start that ascent because the spring itself had a had a tower around it. One of these days we'll find out. All right, we're back on back online. Now, a little-known fact about ancient Jerusalem is that the original Mount Zion, on which that citadel that David then lived in, was on a hill along the ridge that was originally higher than the level of the temple. Now, Josephus tells us that this ridge where the citadel was, was cut down and leveled to the same level as the rest of the ridge over a three-year period during the time of the Maccabees. Now, on the north side of the city of David Ridge, there was originally a deep saddle dip elevation that made the city less easier to take from the north than it is today. Now, also, the Tyropian Valley to the west of the ridge was also much deeper. And the original watercourse from the Gihon Spring before it was later diverted by Hezekiah's town is shown on the map here in green, going south through the Kidron Valley where it was, then it was called the Kedron Brook. Now, our own Kedron Brook here in Brisbane was actually named after it by German missionaries. Now, when I speak next on uh, King Solomon, I'm going to cover some of the latest archaeological discoveries, including what appears to be Solomon's palace in the city of David, plus a worship place near the Gihon Spring that appears to predate the temple. Now, having brought the Ark to Jerusalem, and seeing it in a tabernacle, David desired to build God a house to honour him. God then tells him that his son will be the one who will be allowed to build the temple. And then God promises David that his dynasty, unlike that of Saul, will be an everlasting dynasty over the throne of Israel, which continues today through the British royal throne. 2 Samuel 8 gives us an overview of the series of victories that God gave David against all of Israel's neighbours, allowing Israel to have a time of peace later under King Solomon. He firstly defeats the Philistines to the west, then Moab to the east, then Zobah and Syria to the north, then Ammon to the east, and finally Edom in the southeast. Now, it's during one of these latter wars, the one against Ammon, that David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba takes place, 
which probably took place when David was in his 50s. Now we saw in my previous message that in Saul's time, the Philistines saw to it that the Israelites had no blacksmiths who were able to make them iron tools and weapons. Now after David conquered the Philistines, this whole situation changed and we read in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 14 that King David prepared iron without measure for the temple of God. Now Psalm 83 tells us of an alliance between Asher, or the Assyrians, and Israel's neighbours conspiring to destroy Israel. Now one reason we have thought that Psalm 83 is a future prophecy is because we have thought it wasn't fulfilled anciently. However, if we look more carefully, we will see that there was an ancient fulfilment of this. We read in 1 Chronicles 19 that the Mesopotamians, or Assyrians, and the Syrians provided an astonishing, if it's 32,000 chariots to assist Ammon, or the children of Lot, in its rebellion against David, which quickly involved other nations. Now this was an astonishing two-front war where God really helped Israel to an amazing victory. And it wasn't for another 150 years in Ahab's time when the Assyrians would next become a force in the Middle East against other nations. Now during his campaign against Ammon, David stayed back in Jerusalem. And one sunset he sees a beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Entranced by lust for her and ignoring her marital status, David has her brought to his palace and they have a sexual relationship. Now Bathsheba later tells David that she is pregnant with his child. David then brings back Uriah from the campaign against Ammon and tries to have him sleep with his wife so people will think that Uriah is the father of the child. Now Uriah doesn't sleep with his wife, so David in his desperation to cover his sin has him take back a sealed message to Joab to have Uriah exposed to the hottest part of the war and draw back so he was killed, which then is what happens. Now to have Uriah killed this way was just a horrific thing to do, which greatly angered God. Now even just the adultery by David is an abominable act when you realise that David had at least seven wives at this point in time. Now Gary Smalley and John Trent in The Two Signs of Love make the comment that, almost without exception, our weaknesses are simply a reflection of our strengths pushed to an extreme. Now King David's strength was his passion. His major weakness was not controlling those sexual passions. Now Bathsheba probably had a curvaceous figure to have impacted David from such a distance. Still, David should have pulled back immediately, knowing he was married, but he too easily allowed his passions to get the better of him. Now sexual desires, once stirred up, are extremely difficult to rein back in. So when they desire someone we're not married to, we cannot allow them to get stirred up in the first place. And this brings us to our third lesson that we can learn from King David. Don't linger, but flee away from sexual temptation. Put another way, when it comes to sexual temptation, run, Forrest, run. Now, while the affair is initiated by David, we don't see any hint of resistance to his advances on Bathsheba's part. So there is a fair chance that she was complicit in the affair. Now, while the affair was initiated by David, the reality is that this whole sad, sorry situation probably would have never occurred had Bathsheba been more discreet with her bathing. And she could have bathed indoors, or she could have put up a screen so she wasn't so easily visible to her neighbours. Now, therein lies an important lesson for our young ladies in the church. Now, while I've occasionally seen ladies in the church dressed immodestly from time to time, it's virtually always done unwittingly. There's certainly never been any deliberate intent that I've ever seen. 
That said, our young ladies do need to take care not to accidentally put a stumbling block before our young men in the church. It's important to remember that this world throws an awful lot visually at our young men to tempt them to lust. And so it really is great when our young ladies are discreet and modest and don't and show the right kind of concern for our young men in the church to not accidentally add to that existing pressure. Now when Nathan confronts David with him via a crafty parable, David is convicted and repents of his sin, but the child dies as punishment for the adultery and murder. Now everything was on the line at this moment when David confront, Nathan confronted David. Now had he not responded to the prophet when his sins were so craftily pointed out to him, he probably would have lost the Holy Spirit and would have gone down the same path as Saul, becoming a bitter, self-willed old man. Now thankfully, when confronted with his horrible sins, he made no excuses. Faced with the reality of transgressing God's law, David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Now this willingness to repent when corrected is ultimately what made the difference between David and Saul. Now Saul's two sins that saw him rejected as king, making a sacrifice where he wasn't allowed to, and sparing the spoil and agag, are seemingly much lesser sins than David's. But God is much more interested in our willingness to repent and change from our sins, regardless of whether they are big or small sins. Now this brings us to our fourth lesson that we can learn from King David's life. Take responsibility for your sins and change your ways. Don't resist correction like Saul, but repent as David did. Now in fulfilment of God's word through Nathan, there is turmoil in David's family life. His firstborn son, Amnon, rapes one of his half-sisters, Tamar. Now Absalom, who has eyes on becoming the heir to the throne a couple of years later, then kills Amnon. And then Absalom goes into exile. And when he returns, he mounts a coup to take over from his father. Now David with Bathsheba flees Jerusalem. Absalom enters Jerusalem and violates all of David's wives and concubines. And battle breaks out between the two sides. And in a battle in the forest of Ephraim, Absalom gets his hair caught in an oak tree and is then killed by Joram. Now on his return to Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 20 verse 3 tells us that David took all his wives and concubines with the exception of Bathsheba who left Jerusalem with him and put them in a house under guard and provided for him for them, but did not go into them. David here finally repents of his polygamy. Now it certainly appears that Bathsheba was his favourite wife, despite the scandalous affair, and even considering the verse that mentions Abigail was both someone who was good looking and had good character. Now Israel has become a rich and very powerful nation at this particular time with its control and defeat of many of its neighbouring nations. Now in 2 Samuel 24 verse 1, it says that God was angry not just at David but at the whole nation, most likely because of its pride. Now in the parallel account in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, it says that Satan moved David to take a census. Now it would appear as if God allowed this to see if David would also get carried away with the nation's pride if that was indeed the sin that God was angry about. But he does. And a plague of seven, killing 70,000 people was the tragic result of this foolish mistake that David then later repented of. Now shortly before David's death, Adonijah conspired to be the next king. Now on hearing this, Bathsheba and Nathan remind David of his promise 
to make Bathsheba's son Solomon the next king. And so David has Solomon anointed king and Adonijah's followers turn away from him. Now Solomon was an unusual choice to be anointed the next king. His mother was Bathsheba, who was David's eighth wife and later his sole wife. And also Solomon wasn't the oldest son of Bathsheba's. He, she, he was actually the youngest of four sons that Bathsheba bore David. Now God has seen in the story of the patriarchs often passes over the firstborn son. Now 1 Chronicles 28 verse 5 tells us that God was the one who made his choice as heir known to David. Now one thing that is noticeably absent in David's many final instructions to Solomon was any emphasis on keeping the laws that God specifically had for the kings of Israel, in particular the one against polygamy. Now sadly, Solomon would break this one and ramp it up to a whole new level. Now in 1 Kings 15 verse 5, we read this summary of David's life. David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now John Wesley has this to say in his commentary about this verse. Save only. This and the like phrases are not to be understood as exclusive of every sinful action, but only of a habitual and continued apostasy from God, as the very phrase of turning aside from God. David's other sins were either sudden and transient acts, soon repented of and blotted out, whereas that which concerned Uriah's wife was a designed and studied sin, long continued in, defended with a succession of other sins, presumptuous and scandalous to his government and to the true religion. And remember, it was only after the child was born from adultery that he confessed and repented of his sins, which meant that he had turned, from God, turned his back on God for close to a full year. Now Herbert Armstrong, in his booklet Military Service and War, writes the following about King David. David was a man after God's own heart, not because of his wars, his fighting, his killing. God punished him for that. What did endear David to God was, first of all, David's willingness to admit it when he was wrong and to repent. David loved and obeyed God's law. His attitude was right. He was humble, yet he was strong and unafraid. He was fair in his dealings. He respected authority and those over him. He was compassionate and merciful. He was honest and straightforward. David had many wives, but if you research the record carefully, you'll perhaps be surprised to find that he repented of this, put away his concubines, and in his latter years had only one wife. David sinned, but he acknowledged his sins and repented. Now in conclusion, King David lived a remarkable life of highs and lows, with great mistakes and great deeds done for God. A king, a master musician, and a man after God's own heart. His story will continue in the millennium when he will, under Jesus Christ, rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. And he will work with the 12 apostles who will rule over each of those tribes. So let us learn from David's life and one, courageously and completely trust God as David did. Two, be kind and love our enemies the way that David did. Three, flee from sexual temptation. And four, be willing to take responsibility for our sins the way that King David did. <laughs>